ก๋วยจอบองจุนุนยูเรประกาศมันโตเป็นจำนวนการในเจวิธีสมากาองจำนวนสมประกุลวิธีการตือกรมตำนานทับเรียญดำไปลังเพื่อสกดตบตือนึงการจุตัวระบบกรมวิธีการเปียกดได้จะบรรจบในตปีวิเลียได้บันสำหรับกรมดำนางทรัพย์เรียญสมจริงดังนั้นวันนี้ผมมีสองคำถามที่ผมจะตอบในส่วนแรกนะครับ Um, which is a list of audio and video material. Um, and in the case of this annex, I will um, focus on responding uh, to the specific uh, uh, objections that have been raised um, by the defense. Um, I note, though, that there was uh, some general uh, objections or comments regarding these documents, uh, an assertion by the Noon Che defense that quote unquote authors of these materials should appear in court. So that the, the full context of recorded statements by the accused can be understood. Uh, um, I think it's very unclear who authors are when we're talking about video recordings or audio recordings or the actual words of the accused themselves. The accused are recorded and can be heard. Um, the Inksiri defense similarly asserts that if recordings contain quote-unquote witness statements, they should have the right uh, to confront those persons. Now, my colleague yesterday um, responded to those uh, concepts in general. Um, so I would just note again uh, that this court has already ruled that all authors of materials do not need to appear. And that the issue regarding the use of witness interviews or statements is pending before the chamber. Um, we certainly would take issue with the Inksiri defense attempt to characterize anything anyone ever says as a witness statement. Uh, again, as my colleague discussed yesterday, uh, the rules regarding witness statements are intended to cover certain types of statements, specifically those intended or at least known to be likely to be used in potentially um, returning to specific objections, the Inksiri defense objected to one audio recording, which was D-232-1, .1, .1, .1, .49R, repeat that. D two three two slash one one zero point one point one point four nine R, which is a recorded interview of TCW five three six. And the defense objects because the audio recording is in French and not available in English. Um, of course, audio and video recordings are only being translated um, uh, by the court where they have a corresponding written transcript. Uh, otherwise, uh, they can be translated when clips uh, at such time as clips are played in court, uh, as was done with the clips of the interviews of Kusum Pan that were played uh, at the end of the historical background phase. And also in regard to this particular uh, uh, witness, um, I note that this is a recording of a prior interview of a trial witness, uh, and it was our office's policy and remains our office's policy 
to try to include in our annexes and disclose all past statements of witnesses that we have proposed as trial witnesses or uh, other people who are added to the trial witness list before this court. Uh, and because of that, uh, where we have any type of statement that we have identified, um, we try to make that available as part of the proceedings. The uh, QSIM Parliament Defense has uh, made a number of objections uh, to uh, these materials, which I'll cover next. Uh, there was an objection to document D295-2 slash 2 point two five slash P to repeat that D two nine five slash two slash two slash point two five R I'm reading these slowly and repeating them because uh, yeah, yesterday I was watching on video and was having a hard time keeping these numbers and had to do some searching myself to make sure I have the uh, correct videos that had been uh, objected to. Um, but this first video is one that's entitled Khmer Rouge Military Exercises. And there was a second uh, a video, D295 slash 2.56R, D295 slash 2.56R, which is a video entitled Khmer Rouge Industries. And the defense objection is that these were not relevant to the first trial. Um, these were identified in our annex as potentially relevant uh, to military structure. Uh, and other issues. Uh, however, uh, I did a quick review of those videos myself yesterday, and I can tell the chamber at this time we have no present intention to play them during this trial, so the trial chamber can defer ruling on those uh, two videos uh, for this time. The QSEM PAN team also objects to D210 slash 5R, which is an audio recording of an interview of TCW494. Uh, and to a number of other um, audio recordings of interviews of uh, TCW 92 and TCW 223, um, the list, uh, it was a range of four recordings that starts at uh, D. Two six nine slash nine slash one point nine R and the case file numbers are the same for the other three except that the second one ends in one point one zero R the next one one point one one R and the last one these are all audio recordings of interviews uh, for which we have also uh, identified written transcripts. Uh, as a result, um, those, the written transcripts of those interviews uh, are part of the uh, annex uh, that uh, is pending before the trial chamber in terms of its ruling uh, as to uh, the circumstances under which such witness statements can be used. These are also witnesses um, who have been requested to appear by uh, one of the parties in these proceedings, and that too is a matter pending before the chamber. Uh, we would submit that um, the issue regarding the use of these audio recordings uh, will be uh, uh, dependent upon how the court rules 
on the correspondent uh, witness statements and whether or not uh, these witnesses testify in court. So, uh, uh, in other words, uh, this issue will be dealt with by other rules in this court and need not be separately uh, ruled upon at this time. Um, the Q Sempan team also objected <coughs> to a uh, series of uh, three video recordings of interviews of Q Sempan. Uh, those uh, are case file numbers D313.9R. D313.10R. D and D three one three and the objection D as I heard it was on the grounds air. that the journalist who conducted the interview <coughs> is unknown. And and I'd like the court um, to just see uh, there's no need for this to be translated but to see what the, what this video, uh, this video appears, um, because I think it will be informative uh, to responding to this objection. So, in fact, if the audio, uh, Mr. President, if the audio uh, video booth, we've identified the uh, first of these uh, uh, first of these recordings, D13, uh, excuse me, D313.9R, and uh, I've asked the audio video booth to play a part of that uh, recording so that uh, the court can see it. If that is acceptable, uh, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. ខ្ញុំឈ្មោះគ្រឿងសំផនឪពុកខ្ញុំឈ្មោះគ្រឿងឡុងម្ដាយខ្ញុំឈ្មោះប៉ោកួងឪពុកខ្ញុំគាត់
slash 1.13 R D269 slash 9 slash 1.13 R uh, and this is a uh, audio recording entitled uh, Cham Interview. The Q Sampan team objects on the basis that it is unclear who was interviewed, who conducted the interview, and under what circumstances. Um, contrary to that assertion, when I played uh, the tape yesterday, at the very start, the interviewer identifies himself as Dan. Uh, Dickinson uh, indicates that he was conducting an interview on the 18th of May, 1985 again, it looks to me that it is unlikely that this video or, or this audio recording is likely to be used in, the, in this present proceeding. Uh, so in response to the objection, I would, I would also inform the court uh, that there is uh, no need for the court to rule on this audio as part of the first, first trial. The next annex um, that I will respond to is Annex 11, uh, which are the uh, trial transcripts from Case 001. And the defense have objected to the use of these. And uh, first, as a, as a general response, let me say that uh, our position is that the testimony uh, of these witnesses from case from the case one trial um, should be treated the same as other witness statements, interviews, and testimony um, that are pending before the court in its rulings on annexes 12 and 13. This was probably an oversight in, in terms of our planning here, but. Uh, I think the court's rulings on other witness statements should also apply to the testimony of witnesses in the case one trial. Um, and so whatever the court rules on annexes 12 and 13, we would submit should also govern um, the uh, witness testimony in the case one trial. Um, and I note that um, we have made an effort to disclose statements from other cases um, when they relate to people who are, we have proposed as trial witnesses in this case or they've been selected. We were applauded by the Aung San Defense when we disclosed statements from such witnesses from cases 3 and 4. The same should apply to statements or testimony of witnesses from case 1. Uh, and I would also add to this uh, that uh, much of the testimony in the case one trial transcripts uh, was from Gooch. He is, of course, scheduled to testify next week. And when he does so, it is our position that all, like with other witnesses, all of his prior statements and interviews and testimony will be properly before the chamber. Uh, as the accused will now have a chance to cross-examine uh, the witness. So, uh, simply put, uh, Annex 11 uh, can be dealt, dealt, thrown, thrown into the same group as Annexes 12 and 13 and ruled on the subject of that ruling in our, in our submission. And that brings me to the last annex uh, uh, that I will address today, uh, which is Annex 10, uh, the S21 Confessions. Uh, this is an issue that we could talk at length about 
I'm not I will not, not do that ni. today. I will endeavor to make a few general comments um, because I think the issues um, that relate to the use of these documents in the current trial um, are somewhat more limited than perhaps issues that will arise uh, in the case that includes S21. Um, the defense objections that were made in the last few days uh, were general objections based on the torture convention and relevance. I at least did not hear any objections based on authenticity. Um, I nonetheless note that there can be little question about the authenticity of these particular records. Um, as with other documents from S21, there is a fairly consistent structure or format to the documents, uh, as well as thumbprints, uh, repeated initials, signatures, uh, many indicia uh, of authenticity. Uh, on top of that, uh, the chairman of S21 which, uh, has confirmed uh, the authenticity of many of these confessions, uh, both the underlying documents themselves and, importantly, also annotations made on the documents by himself, by Son Sen, by Noon Chia, uh, and, uh, and uh, some of the interrogators. So there is no question about the authenticity of, of these records. Now, in regards the, to the general admissibility of the documents and the defense objections based on the torture convention, uh, I would make a few observations at this time. First, uh, as my colleague discussed uh, yesterday, uh, the torture convention has a very express criteria that only results in the exclusion of statements shown to have been obtained by torture. Uh, and their discussions and objections, I've heard some fairly broad statements um, from the defense council, statements to the effect that anything associated with S21 is tainted and should be viewed with skepticism. And admittedly, these statements are vague, but it suggests that the defense would like the court to build a wall around S21 and not allow any evidence related to the operation of that prison before this court. Um, but of course, that, that is not the law. Um, there is no fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine uh, that applies to the torture convention. And I realize that that term may not translate well, uh, so let me explain uh, in case some people do not know, uh, understand that reference. Um, there is a doctrine uh, developed in American jurisprudence that if an illegal search, if a suspect's rights has been violated, an illegal search has been conducted, uh, evidence, any evidence that results from the violation of the rights from the illegal search cannot be used. Not only the evidence that was immediately taken in the illegal search, but evidence, subsequent evidence that was derived as a result of that initial violation. There is no such doctrine in regards to the torture convention. Uh, the, the accused would like there to be, they would like uh, any use of anything that was done by interrogators at S21 to be off, uh, uh, to be barred, so that we can talk about it. But of course, that is inconsistent with the purpose of the torture convention, which is to ensure that people are prosecuted for torture. To put this another way, there is no rule that bars the admission showing how S21 confessions were used by the regime. As one example of that, the fact that copies of confessions were sent to Son Sen, to Noon Chea, and to the heads of the organizations of the interrogated cadres, 
and used by them as a basis to identify other suspect cadres within the organization. The facts of how these confessions were used are legitimate issues uh, before the court that are not barred by the torture convention because to do so would prevent the prosecution uh, of one of the largest schemes of torture the world has ever seen. Second general point regarding the torture convention is that one of the intended uses of all the documents in this annex is simply to identify the persons who were detained, interrogated, and tortured at S21. I have already heard at least one of the defense teams uh, openly concede that this is a permissible use of confessions that falls within the exception of Article 15 of the Convention. And indeed, this is the very reason that some of the S21 confessions, as well as prisoner lists, are cited in paragraphs of the closing order uh, in the upcoming segment that, we, segment that we will be trying. And I'm referred to paragraphs 38, 43, 50, and 99, um, which are paragraphs that uh, talk about uh, the arrests or reference the arrests of uh, members of the Central Committee and party leaders and cite as evidence of that uh, prisoner lists or confessions in S21 to show that in fact these people were arrested. Because of this fairly simple point, um, the issue of admissibility in regards to S21 confessions we submit is a relatively easy one, as no one has disputed that these confessions, confessions are at least admissible um, for that purpose of identifying the persons who were detained at S21. And we would submit, Your Honors, that the real issue that is before you will not be admissibility of these documents, but rather the permissible uses of the documents. And I will address the other possible uses of the S21 confession records uh, as part of my explanation uh, of the other bases uh, on which these documents are relevant in this case. Before doing that, um, uh, one last general comment uh, I would like to make regarding the application of the torture convention um, relates to uh, the different types of documents that are contained within the S21 confession files that are part of this annex. It is very important for the chamber uh, to understand that these files often contain much more than just the signed confession of the S21 detainee. In fact, it would be more accurate to describe uh, these documents as the entire files maintained by S21 relating to individual prisoners. So the documents uh, that are listed on this annex often include, in addition to the actual confessions, notes between exchange between the interrogators and Dutch, and reports from the interrogators to Dutch and his superiors describing the process of how the detainee was interrogated, whether or not torture was used, their assessment of the information obtained and other matters. These other documents are not statements uh, of the detainee. They are not statements that were obtained by torture. They are communications either between uh, the cadres in S21 or communications in which S21 cadres are reporting uh, to the higher level on what was going on in the prison. As such, there is no basis for them to be excluded by the torture convention. Now, I recognize that uh, a lot of these documents will be much more important uh, uh, when we get 
uh, to a trial regarding the torture and crimes that were committed at S21. Um, there are frequent uh, these, these reports that were prepared by the interrogators uh, and often sent to the superiors, uh, to Doik's superiors, uh, often describe uh, in detail the use of torture and other matters. Um, but there is other information that sometimes appear in these that will also be important uh, to these proceedings. And that is why uh, it is important to understand that these documents are more than just confessions from the Now, proceeding to relevance, um, there are a number of reasons uh, as to why uh, the S-21 confessions are relevant to the current proceedings. Uh, in addition to the matter I've already discussed, which is, uh, as with the S-21 biographies, as with the S-21 prisoner records, they are a way to identify the persons who were, who were detained at S-21. And that list uh, is a very reflective list that shows uh, the, the organizational structure of the regime because of the fact that prisoners came from all different organizations. But in, in addition to that basic uh, use, um, there are a number, at least three other uses that I will uh, briefly touch upon uh, of these S-21 confessions uh, that are relevant to the current proceedings. The um, uh, first such issue is that the documents, these documents demonstrate the authority and responsibility of the standing committee, the accused, and the heads of DK organizations for security matters. The authority structure of the re regime and what were the relevant respective authorities of the standing committee, uh, heads of ministries, heads of zones, is part of the upcoming segment of this trial. Um, what do the S-21 confession files uh, tell us about that issue? Well, quite, quite a lot, actually. Uh, starting with uh, something that I think most people are familiar with, um, which is that the cover pages of these confessions are frequently and usually annotated. Um, typically in handwriting, in either Doik's handwriting, Son Sen's handwriting, and sometimes Noon Che's handwriting, with annotations uh, indicating who the confessions were sent to. We have identified so far um, at least 26 confessions that have an annotation uh, written by either Duch or Son Sen indicating that the confession was sent to Noon Chea. I will not list those 26 confessions at this time, uh, but when we get uh, as part, certainly as part of the proceedings, some of them will be presented, and when we get to the conclusion and are asked uh, to the stage where we are to present important documents, um, we will certainly uh, submit the entire list to you at this time, but I will spare you at this time for me reading into the record the list of 26 documents. There are an additional uh, number of confessions um, so far in which Doik has identified the handwriting as that of Noon Chea. And there are other uh, confessions that have a more general annotation, uh, such as uh, from Son Sen or Doik indicating they were sent to brother. There are confessions uh, annotated indicating they were sent to Ying Siri. And there are many confessions um, that also have an annotations indicating they were sent to, for example, the Northwest Zone. Uh, secretary, if it was a, sec a confession of a cadre from that zone, 
to a, the head of a military division, if it was a cadre from that division, uh, and so on. In other words, uh, as Deutsch has testified, it was the standard practice to send a copy of the confession uh, to the head of the organization. The fact uh, that this process occurred um, it tells us and shows to us who it was that had the authority uh, in relation to ultimately deciding uh, on arrests and what were the responsibilities of the relative organizations in Democratic Kampuchea and what was the responsibility of the accused. As I noted this morning, in the next trial segment, uh, the issue is the military structure and the roles of the accused in relation to military security matters. Uh, in addition to the annotations uh, showing who the responsible uh, leaders of Democratic Kampuchea who, um, who received these confessions, um, there are also uh, significant uh, uh, statements in uh, uh, some of the uh, documents extraneous to the confessions that I mentioned. So, for example, uh, an example of this is a document D288 slash 6.5 slash 2. Point four seven. This is a confession uh, of a cadre um, from a district in the East Zone uh, named Chop included in the confession file is a handwritten note from Deutsch to his interrogator Paul. And point two of Deutsch's note um, advises upon that quote, brother number two has advised on the 25th of February 1978 that the names of certain cadres must be withdrawn if they appear in this confession. And there is a list of various leaders of sectors and military divisions from the East Zone. What is the significance of this document? Clearly, this is pretty strong uh, confirmation uh, of uh, Noon Che's role uh, and in providing instructions to Doik uh, regarding uh, S-21 and the interrogations. Um, admittedly, this will be more important. This is one of these issues that we talked about yesterday that is a foundational issue of who had what responsibility that will be part of the basis for, for this and future trials. But uh, there are references like this um, that are not part of the statements of the detainee. This is a statement by Deutsch, uh, so there is no argument that this could be barred by the torture convention, and it's a contemporaneous statement that very clearly shows Yun Che's role in these matters. Uh, another uh, couple of examples uh, of some documents uh, that are separate from the confessions uh, that you will find in these files um, that are relevant uh, on this basis. Uh, one is, uh, the, is in the confession uh, of Hunim, who is the Minister of Propaganda. And one of the initial documents uh, that's found in this, uh, in this uh, IS 5.30, which is the document, uh, is a letter that Hunim wrote, um, a letter addressed to, quote, um, brother Paul, Brother Nguyen, bon Paul, Brother Van, bon Nguyen, Brother Vorn, bon Wan, bon Vorn, Cadre Q and Hem. The letter starts, today, 10th of April 1977, 
Okay. Well, I was extremely busy preparing a radio broadcast to memorialize the second anniversary of the great victory of 17 April 1975. Padre Pang called me on the phone to work with Ankar. Pang, for those of you who don't know, was the chairman of S71, um, one of the principal organizations responsible for uh, arresting uh, cadres and taking them to S71. Hunim con continues, quote, I was very surprised and did not expect to be arrested by a military. At first, I did not believe that it was the group of cadre Pang. I was not guilty as I did not betray and I was truthful with Ankar. I suspected that some enemies may have implicated me. He then goes on to continue and at the end uh, of his letter states, quote, I firmly reassure the party that I have never betrayed the party at all. I have never been involved with the CIA, the Vietnamese, the Sun Ngoc Thanh's agents or liberalists. Now again, this is a document, as indicated at the outset, that was written by Hunim at the time he was arrested, a letter he sent to the people that he understood as the Ministry of Propaganda to be responsible for his arrest. And the people he addressed this letter to saying, why are you arresting me? I'm, I'm not a traitor. Uh, that list includes Pol Pot, Yun Chea, Ying Siri, Warren Vet, Son Sen, and Q Sun Pan. Again, this is another compelling piece contemporaneous evidence that shows the standing committee uh, and uh, central committee members as well uh, responsibility in relation to security matters. A similar type of document uh, is found in the confession file uh, of the ministry, uh, minister, I'm sorry, the Minister of Agriculture, uh, Chase Swan, uh, alias Non Swan. Uh, this is document IS 5.69. And contained, again, within this confession file uh, is a number of documents that are separate uh, from the actual confession of the detainee. Some <laughs> Yes, the, 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 the uh, detainee was the uh, Minister of Agriculture, and the name um, uh, Che Swan, let me spell um, first the family name, C-H-E-Y, uh, and then S-U-O-N. Alias Non Swan, N O N, how non, and second name S U O N. Non Swan, Jay Swan, how non Swan, and uh, contained uh, within um, IS 5.69 is a number of documents that are separate from the actual confession, uh, including a letter or note. Um, that was sent from the interrogator, uh, interrogator Pon, again, on the 15th of November 1976, he wrote a uh, several page letter or note uh, to the detainee, uh, and one of the initial statements at the very start of this letter indicates that his uh, detention was a matter that had been decided by the standing committee of the party. Um, so I cite this again as examples of materials that are separate from the confessions um, that will be relevant um, to the authority 
I have touched upon this already, but a, a second um, area issue uh, in these proceedings uh, that uh, these confessions are relevant to is that the annotations themselves show the annotations show how the confessions uh, were sent to various heads of organizations, and therefore. Uh, uh, reflect the reporting uh, system that existed between the center and between zones and uh, military divisions as to how information was reported between them uh, regarding security issues and in particular uh, how communications were done as to people who were, who were to be viewed as suspect and monitored. And a principal way that that was done was through uh, the communication uh, of uh, the S21 confessions, in particular the lists of implicated parties. Um, so these documents also have relevance um, to the communication structure and how information was reported uh, in the regime. And uh, the last uh, area or, uh, the way in which these documents are relevant uh, concerns uh, an issue that uh, is uh, uh, part of the next phase, uh, uh, phase of the trial, um, and that is paragraph 112 of the closing order. Uh, this is a section of the closing order that deals with communications and it deals with various uh, entities uh, um, communication organizations within the Ministry of Propaganda, uh, one of which was the radio, the DK radio uh, system. And uh, there's been a lot of discussion already about the DK radio broadcasts that were captured by Civis, uh, also captured by the BBC summary world of broadcasts. We've seen a number of those documents. Uh, but in uh, paragraph 112 of the closing order, which is part of the next segment. Um, uh, the start of that uh, paragraph, the first sentence is as follows. Confessions of Vietnamese prisoners of war who had been interrogated at S-21 were broadcast over the radio. So uh, what is the evidence of that? Well, there are many, of course, there are many um, DK radio broadcasts um, that can be put before the court uh, in which Vietnamese, uh, confessions of Vietnamese prisoners were broadcast and captured um, by, fit, by uh, reported at FIBIS. Um, but we have uh, identified, been able to match up four of those radio broadcasts to actual S-21 confessions that we have in the files, um, so that the court can see uh, that what was broadcast on the Democratic Camp of Chia responds exactly to the, S the confession that was found years later at Tool Slang. This is significant for, for quite a few reasons. Um, first of all, purely in terms of the reliability of uh, the FIBIS reports. Uh, this is pretty good corroboration um, that when FIBIS reported the matters that were broadcast on the Democratic Campus Radio, they got it right. Uh, you can follow the FIBIS report and see how it, how it matches paragraph by paragraph with the confession from S21. Um, so there is a significance to these documents uh, to corroborate the accuracy of FIBIS records, which is something we've talked a lot about in this proceeding, so it's an important issue. Um, but even beyond that, more, more than that, the fact that the radio station at the Ministry of Propaganda was broadcasting word for word confessions that came from S21 is a very important fact as it shows control, organized control of this process 
So let me uh, give to you the, the four examples that we found. Um, D-1001, uh, uh, contains uh, is the FIBIS report of a 12 June 1978 broadcast by the uh, Phnom Penh Domestic Service, which was the uh, DK radio operation. Uh, of the confession of a Vietnamese spy, Tran Ngoc Tung, which confession uh, was dated 9th of June 1978. The S-21 confession that corresponds exactly to that radio broadcast is document D-175-2.1. D-175-2.4. Which is the S-21 confession of this Vietnamese prisoner of war. The second example, uh, the DK radio broadcast is contained in D108-50-2.1. That's D108-50-2.1. It is uh, the report uh, and it contains uh, a report uh, broadcast on the 10th of April 1978 of a confession uh, of Vin Min Chao that was made on the 3rd of April 1978. And I think that this is part of a, a large, uh, one of the monthly FIBIS reports. So let me give the specific year-end pages for this, this one. Uh, they are English 00168793 to 1687941. Uh, French ERN 00316464 through 316465 and, and Khmer ERN 00 0 through and the S21 confession, which again corresponds exactly to what was broadcast over the radio by the Ministry of Propaganda, uh, is a uh, document um, uh, that was identified uh, uh, as a new document uh, in our uh, July or April uh, filing. Uh, it is in English. 
how he and she be sang ong le khmer uh, the relevant uh, the pages are khmer 0005923 through 0005923 and i think the french translation of this is still kind of, and just to clarify um, this was a document that we disclosed as part of our original document lists back uh, at the start of last, or in April of last year, a year ago, um, before the start of trial. So when we listed these documents in the annex as new, it was simply because these documents did not have case file numbers. Uh, these should be distinguished from uh, documents that are subject to the uh, standard, higher standards as new documents introduced after the start of trial. Um, uh, so I want to make sure that that clarification that that is clear because I know this is an issue that, that, that has come up. And uh, very quickly, uh, uh, the uh, other two examples, um, document D108 slash 28.262 pi. That's D108 slash 28.262. Uh, this is a BBC broadcast uh, uh, summarizing um, the broadcast of a, uh, a confession uh, from the DK radio uh, and of a individual named Vong Nok Sun. And the corresponding S21 confession uh, that we have identified is document D175-2.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0